So we've been asked a number of times to do a video on this subject. And it's always been there ready to do sort of in the list of topics we want to cover, but then something else will be released would have some sort of major change to immigration that would occur and it'd be pushed to the side, sort of dragged away um, onto work on some other matter. However, after some truly horrible misinformation went out a few days ago, this has been dragged back front and centre and we'll finally be covering it in a video. So for all of you who have asked for it, here is the video you have asked for. This is all about the culturally arranged marriage or the CAM. It is 10.30 a.m. on Thursday 14th of October 2021. My name is Aaron Hunt, a partner at the law firm Stace Hammond, and I head up the immigration team there. Uh, as always, this is not Im uh, immigration advice, it is just our commentary on immigration here in New Zealand in the news. Um, and if you want actual legal advice on immigration, please get in contact with us at the address below or through our website, stacehammond.co.nz. Um, as always, if you find this video of use, please like this video, share it with others, pass it around and subscribe to get uh, notifications of future videos that we put out. Okay, I was thinking about if I would cover the misinformation first or the uh, CAM visa requirements first, and I think I'm going to start with the most important part being actually covering the CAM visa requirements. Uh, then I'll look at the misinformation that was put out in the last few days. Um, I don't want to mention the name of the person who put out the misinformation, as I'm sure he enjoys the attention. I think that's what, um, a large part of what this is all about. Um, he's already caused so much hurt and heartbreak to the community. Uh, people who heard this misinformation thanked him for allegedly what he had done, um, only to have their hopes crushed when they talked to myself or one of the colleagues that um, we put a press release out on. And I've linked to the press release down below. Uh, I'll talk more about that later in the video. Now, this is not a perfect visa. It has flaws, and we will mention some of those in this video. But we wanted to get out some information just to clarify the misinformation that has gone out and hopefully give you uh, a better understanding as to um, what this visa is, how it works, um, its good parts, its bad parts, um, and the things to look out for. And to those immigration professionals who posted messages to thank him, for um, this after seeing his misinformation. I have real concerns for your clients uh, that you couldn't see the issues in what he was saying from the start. Uh, from our point of view and those from those uh, people who I spoke with in the industry, the opening line of the article in the uh, major news publication straight away was a massive red flag saying, well, we just thought, well, this is clearly not correct what he is saying here. Um, and I am shocked that so many of you thanked him for effectively nothing. Um, so let's look at CAM visas. Uh, now, the first thing to say is that this isn't open to everyone. Uh, there is no allowance for uh, partners of any other visa types other than residents and citizens. Okay, the basics of the CAM visa, uh, it's all about acknowledging that arranged marriages exist and don't fit into um, immigration New Zealand's typical Western view of relationships. It doesn't cover all cultures who may not meet the um, INZ requirements for other partnership relationships, um, but it does cover a large number. For typical visas for under partnership, there is a requirement for the couple to have lived together. The reasoning we have been told for that is that a couple needs to be genuine and stable. And the only way to know if a couple is stable is if they have lived together and living together creates new pressures on a relationship that the couple might not have otherwise experienced just from being in a relationship but not living together. Of course, the same could be said about a number of different situations that a couple might, may go through. Um, such as having a child that will create different stresses to the relationship. But they haven't included that. It's just that living together has long been the sort of base requirement for any partnership-based visa apart from CAM. However, of course, culturally arranged marriages don't work this way as typically living together is not part of a culturally arranged marriage, it's definitely frowned upon. Uh, a culturally arranged marriage is where the matchmaking has taken place under traditional cultural practices, typically being that the family has made the selection, discussed the possibility of marriage, and then introduced the idea to the parties. Um, a couple of quick points on that, as we have seen, or well, we saw some of the comments that were posted to the article in the national uh, paper um, that were spreading the misinformation. 
and some of them were quite derogatory to the practice. Now, cultural arranged marriages are not forced marriages. The party have to have the parties, the parties have to have met um, at some point, have to have agreed to the marriage and given the chance to say no to the marriage. Uh, they, they, so it isn't about you sort of arriving on the day of your marriage, meeting this person at the altar and basically you're getting married. There is, prior to that immigration, we're looking to see that you have had a chance to communicate and actually agree to the match um, taking place. Um, the focus here is on the how the marriage was arranged um, and how the couple was in, um, initially introduced and then the procedures after that. Now, at no point in the history of the CAM visa has INZ ever required the applicants of a CAM visa to have lived together prior to um, getting married. The misinformation stated that they required uh, 12 months living together. Um, that is just absolutely and completely untrue, and INZ have never suggested that. Uh, those of you who are from these cultures will understand that living together before a culture arranged marriage is not how it works. INZ knows this, and it is why they have never had an application, uh, never had this as a requirement for these applications. In fact, living together before the marriage may actually have a negative impact on such an application as Immigration New Zealand would question whether it was following uh, tr cultural traditions. Now, the visa works in one of two ways. It either allows the offshore party to come to New Zealand to get married, or it allows the newly married partner's partner to, enter, to apply to enter New Zealand. That second change, uh, allowing a marriage to occur offshore, was the most recent sort of significant change to the CAM process um, added in 2019. Um, there's been no real changes since then, or certainly none uh, thanks to the person spreading the misinformation. So either the um, applicant comes to New Zealand to get married, um, or they apply having gotten married offshore. Now, either way, it is a, a three-month allowance, effectively. So if you are coming to New Zealand, you, the visa you get will be a three-month visa to be in the country to get married. If you are applying from offshore, you must apply within three months of getting married um, or prior to the marriage taking place. Um, now, one thing INZ will be looking at is how the original contact was made. And this is where we often see applications going badly and where we do believe Immigration New Zealand may need to rethink, rethink their approach. The requirement that INZ is looking for is uh, community and family involvement in the introduction um, and marriage dis discussions. The idea is that two family members, one for each family, will have met somewhere, possibly through a third party, and they discuss the possibility of the couple marrying. Uh, this will often lead to further discussions, well, pretty much always lead to further discussions, the families meeting, the couples meeting and talking, um, and an agreement to marriage being met between the families, with the couples agreeing to that marriage taking place. The issue is that initial contact. More and more often we see couples whose families find each other through matrimonial websites. Um, these websites like uh, shadi.com, I think is the largest one, uh, are set up to assist families with matchmaking, uh, maintaining a cultural tradition but utilizing modern technology. However, Immigration New Zealand doesn't seem to see it that way. The use of matrimonial website is not seen as following tradition and it's falling outside that sort of cultural arrangements. So Immigration New Zealand is determining what it considers culturally appropriate um, or not, um, despite these services being you know, very widely used and merely facilitating a traditional process just in an electronic way. But then we see the issues going the other way. We've seen applicants who have done things completely traditional, um, all done through temple, and then they're declined because they can't show enough electronic communication or any at all to show the discussions between um, the parties that took place. Even when we have temple priests who have written to immigration, you know, sort of laid out what the cultural traditions are, how they've been followed, um, detailing all of that for immigration, Immigration New Zealand are saying, well, there's been, where's the electronic communication between the families? Well, if they both in the same temple and it was all done, um, you know, word of mouth personally, that won't exist. Um, and so Immigration New Zealand has decided about how much of the process can be modernized. There has to be some modernized using electronic communications, but it can't be modernized to the point 
um, that they use shiny.com or a similar website. Um, so it needs to be some a little, little bit modernized, but not too much modernized. And this is an issue we have with Immigration New Zealand, where they shouldn't be the ones who are defining what is culturally appropriate um, in that culture. Now, of course, the evidence needs to be more than just communication, but there is no set list. Um, now, in V3351, now, of course, when I, when I refer to a letter followed by a number, I'm referring to the operational manual, the, the rule book for immigration, and I provide a link to that section in the description down below. <clears throat> so V3351, INZ provides what they need the evidence to show. So it's not so much here's the evidence we require, it's here's the things that the evidence needs to, to provide or needs to um, show for us. Letters from, uh, letters from those involved in the matchmaking um, process definitely help, you know, giving timelines, who did what, when. Um, evidence of that communications, as I said, the electronic communications is uh, a factor, it seems now. Um, we'll often see correspondence from a, a temple or a mosque to confirm that traditional pro uh, procedures and processes have taken place. Uh, we'll perhaps see, for some cultures, uh, star charts mapping out what is the best day to be married for the couple for the for the greatest um, luck and fortune going forward. Uh, we'll see evidence of elaborate engagement parties. We'll have wedding DVDs. Actually, one client gave me seven DVDs uh, of their ceremony. It was a I actually I skimmed through, watched bits of it. It was a long ceremony, but very traditional for for their culture. Um, now, on actually on that point as to large weddings. Immigration New Zealand will often expect weddings uh, to be large, especially from certain cultures. We did see Immigration New Zealand question the truthfulness of one relationship under a partnership visa rather than CAM, um, as it only had 40 people at the wedding, which they believe was unheard of in that culture. But for a Western culture, 40 people is, you know, we have weddings with 10 people in them. So 40 is actually fairly average um, these days for what we call an intimate wedding. Um, but for Immigration New Zealand, they saw that as being um, an issue because 40 wasn't big enough for their culture. Uh, when actually we think it should be, at least in that situation, their choice. So like so many applications, there is no sort of set list of the best evidence to provide or the minimum evidence to provide. It will, it's all about um, giving evidence to prove those points that they list in V3351. It will often be that uh, the best case to sort of give your lawyer or your advisor every bit of evidence you have. But this is the kind of application where you do really want to have a lawyer or an advisor involved because these are ones that do get declined a lot. Um, so you want to make sure that you make the best application and make use of their experience um, with these applications in the past and what they see as being, you know, the best way to provide information and what information is, has the most impact. Now, if the application is successful, then a three-month visa will be granted. If the applicant, applicant is offshore, they will have six months to enter New Zealand, and the visa will have effect on their arrival in the country. The marriage hasn't occurred yet, and it's taking place in New Zealand. It needs to occur in that three-month period, after which you start living together. Uh, now, the day after you start living together, we always say to our clients, submit the application for, for a partnership, a work visa, um, partnership visa, um, at that point. Um, and start collecting evidence from that point for when the immigration officer actually asks for it. Now, there is no need to spend three months together before you apply, as people keep telling us they've been told by other people. Um, and the very nature of this visa only being three month, months in length shows that that is not a requirement. The requirement is that you are living together when you apply. So once you're living together, make that application. Now, for those who are onshore, um, we've already... We've always submitted applications um, for partnership as soon as people start living together. So there's no need to, to wait and delay, just get that done. Where to from here? It is clear that this visa type was created in an effort to allow culturally arranged marriages to fall within instructions. And we do believe that Immigration New Zealand put it together with the best intentions. Um, however, it needs to be more accepting in that there is no set legislated way in which a culturally arranged marriage takes place. The cultures do not dictate the method in which matchmaking takes place, so ID needs to be to accept the use of a matchmaking website by the families of the couples as basically just being a modernization of the traditional process. Similarly, the most traditional of culturally arranged marriages may not have electronic documentation. So INZ needs to look at other evidence and not decline because the families do not, didn't provide a digital record of their correspondence. 
um, as they were standing next to each other. Um, these are not difficult things to change. It would also be good to see CAM expanded from culturally arranged marriages to perhaps customary marriages. Uh, these may include marriages between couples who may have dated for years, but cultural religion prevents them from living together until marriage. Um, this focus on only cultures that arrange marriage so can't live together ignores other cultures that perhaps can't live together um, just because of, of their religion or culture itself. INZ have decided that some customary practice approaches to marriage, such as CAM, should be respected and others shouldn't. And we don't believe that is right. We believe that they should be looking at um, customary ma marriages as a whole, rather than just narrowing it down to just this one group. Now, that sort of covers um, to a, a, a small degree as to how CEM uh, visas work. This is not meant to be a complete and absolute breakdown of the subject that would take a lot of time. Um, but I wanted to just give you some ideas as to how it works and some of the, the issues that we've seen in there. Um, I did also, in regards to the misinformation, I did want to check to make sure that I'd covered all the misinformation that the original post, uh, original person posted and the national uh, paper um, and a radio station sort of all put out there as being fact. Um, sadly, after the national paper was notified, they did remove large chunks of the information from the article, uh, but made no note that it was uh, significantly altered you should do better. If you're going to modify an article um, in such a drastic way, make a note or at the very least put out an apology that the misinformation was in there in the first place. Now this seems to be just complete, um, completely ignoring the fact that you were putting out things that were not true. The radio station who suggested that I should listen to an interview with this person um, have now actually removed their post of his misinformation. Um, now, if you have lawyers and immigration advisors posting on your posts on Facebook saying you're spreading misinformation, you may want to take some notice to that. Um, you're, hurt, you're hurting your community um, who trust you to provide them with, with factual, true information. The Indian Weekend uh, published the press release that we were a signatory of, and we do thank them for that. However, they then gave uh, the original misinformation uh, spreader a chance to respond, in which he spread more misinformation. Uh, he talks about his engagement with immigration as the president of a group that, despite Google searches and talking to um, people in the community, nobody else seems to, seems to be able to find any other mention of other than when he mentions this group. Um, he talks about being relieved about getting progress when there has been no progress and no changes to this visa for several years. He talks about being appreciated by many immigration advisors for his work, but we can't see why. In his response, he actually did uh, make a statement that refers to myself and my colleagues put the press release out. And I wanted to just um, say this verbatim um, because I take, I take offense to what is being suggested in this. Um, he says, we'll also understand a, we also understand a small group of people, those may have some other past or ongoing issues with INZ, appeared unhappy with our continuing engagement with INZ. They're entitled to have their views and personal opinion on such policies. We respect and encourage them to please contact the INZ if they have any issues and clarifications. We also want to assure them that we are not harming or taking their clients or, and business away. In fact, getting it streamlined may help them more and make things easier for them and their clients. So that was his, his quote, which, which rubbed me the wrong way, uh, I will say that. Uh, now, that small group he's referring to is myself. We've got Katie Armstrong, Alistair McClement, Anu Kalotti, Pooja Sunda, and Stuart Daly. Um, they are people that many of you will know and hopefully trust and respect. These are not about, um, it's not about our opinion or trying to protect our business. This is about wanting to protect the community from misinformation. Even now, after being caught spreading misinformation, he tries to turn it into an argument about money um, that we got together. Um, as a group of, of lawyers and immigration advisors to protect our work and our income. I don't get paid to make these videos, <laughs> it's very clear, or to spend the hours and hours I, I do responding to, to inquiries and questions and having people out. Um, this morning, 5 a.m., it's like, you know, almost six hours ago, I've been sitting at this computer answering queries and having people out without charging them um, I've done maybe an hour of actual work for paying clients, the rest just, I'm there because I want to help the community. Um, 
And I know that Katie works daily with MPs to try and get better immigration policies in through government. Um, I know he spends a lot of time working with the Migrant Workers Association to help them um, get better for, for, for their members. Um, and the, the other, my colleagues do much the same, always spending extra time, a lot of time, which isn't there, but isn't about the money, it's about helping the community. Uh, we all do these things not to make money, to help, to help all of you um, and make sure the information that is out there is, is correct and to give you the best shot at making a, a legit application. Um, so I take offense to being said that um, we're complaining about what he was doing because the money was paid about what he was doing because it was misinformation. He was spreading false hopes. So by spreading this information, um, by, and by giving these, this false hope, by not taking care about what he said to the media, he has caused significant harm to his own community. And even now he doesn't seem to care or acknowledge the harm that he's done. He still tries to show himself as being an expert in this, um, this, this um, Indian weekend uh, uh, response that he made, despite clearly not understanding immigration. He actually provides a list of five, five items that he says are relaxation and changes. So let's just go through these five items. And number one, the visitor visas under CAM will continue to be processed during the pandemic. This is not a change or rela relaxation as it says it in the line. They will continue. They've been being processed through the pandemic anyway. There's no change there. They will continue to be processed. Uh, people granted CAM, number two, people granted CAM will be exempt from border exceptions and are able to travel to New Zealand. Again, this is not a change or relaxation. This is how it already was. Number three, one year living together is not required. As I've said, it has never been required. There is no need to live together under CAM. Um, by continuing to mention it, he's repeating this earlier harm that he has fixed that no longer need to live together. You never had to under CAM. This is not a change, not a relaxation, never been a requirement. Number four, an applicant who is already married or intending to marry in New Zealand will be given six months to enter. Again, not a change or relaxation, that's just how it is. You have six months to enter the country, at which point the visa starts, the three-month visa kicks off once you're in here. Uh, number five, under the new guidelines, if an individual is traveling to New Zealand to join a partner, they may be considered a genuine applicant if other conditions like health and character were met. Now that ignores the other requirement that we've been through in this video to show you know, what is required for a camp. But there is no new guidelines. The guidelines have not changed since 2019. Um, this is how things are. He has made no difference. There's nothing new there. So in his five relaxation and changes, there are no relaxation and changes. They're just stating facts that have been in place for years. He then says that it is a great relief for the supporting partners and their partners, um, but he hasn't done anything to actually create a relief. There is no great relief. Any relief that they had was based on misinformation. He gave false hopes by announcing changes when there weren't any. Uh, any relief that were gained were dashed when they spoke to, to an actual expert by myself or one of my colleagues. Um, now, I'm just I'm going to leave it there. This is clearly frustrating me when this sort of things happen because it means that we get um, the job to crush people's spirits. Um, there is something that my colleagues and I are passionate about. We are passionate about this, about this topic, passionate about immigration, passionate about people getting a fair shot at immigration. We've had, all of us had people contact us excited about these new changes that weren't actually a change, leading us to, to break their spirits and give them the bad news that nothing had changed and they had no, no new right to enter the country. Um, I'll be sending this video to the Indian Weekend in the hope that they can provide a correction to the misinformation they are now providing in his response um, and hopefully make them more cautious um, about statements made from non-professionals in the future, um, possibly from him. Um, to the person who created this mayhem, I'm not going to name you, you are harming your own community. Those who believe you when you say you are a leader, please just stop. To everybody else, uh, kia kaha, stay safe.